Um, one other thing that I just want to mention now to get it in people's minds, since you are, I assume none of you are freshmen, I haven't actually checked, there is a really good opportunity for science students, REU, um, Research Experience for Undergrads, I think is what it stands for, but it's sponsored by the National Science Foundation. There are lots and lots and lots of summer research opportunities out there. They pay you in the ballpark of $4,000 for the summer, plus your room and board, you know, plus travel. So basically they pay for all your expenses and then they give you like $4,000, not mine, <laughs> like $4,000 at the end of the summer. So it's a really great opportunity to get in and do some research. And you can just, you know, Google REU and the area you're interested in, in science and get a huge list of different options to apply for. And I would encourage anyone interested to apply. You may not get in, but if you do get in, it's a wonderful experience. And the deadlines for these are like November through um, February, depending on which one you're looking at. But you want to make sure you start looking at them you know, before the deadline's passed. So I just wanted to mention that so people are aware of that opportunity, because I don't think we mentioned it enough. All right. There's supposed to be here a picture of your textbook. Somehow it didn't translate. Today we're starting Chapter 3. Chapter 3 is... It seems like it's a non sequitur because we're going to be talking about motion in more than one dimension. And then next chapter, we'll go back to talking about kinematics again. The reason we have to have this chapter sandwiched in here is because a lot of people are a little weak on trigonometry. And so this chapter is basically to strengthen your trig trigonometry skills and to learn how to do the trigonometry that we need for physics. So this picture, it's actually from a roller coaster in Spain. I tell you, I look at that and I thought, well, that's got to be from Worlds of Fun, but it's, it's not. Um, is it Worlds of Fun? World of Fun? I don't know. So it's just an example. Almost everything we do in life involves more than one dimension of motion. Now, when I say dimension of motion, you guys are probably too young to think of, you know, do, 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 do. <laughs> Twilight Zone, yes. A dimension of, well, when we talk about dimensions of motion, we talk about the directions we can move. And it turns out that if you're going to define directions, you have to have them all perpendicular to each other for them to be what we say is independent. Independent means, like, if I move this direction, it doesn't change my position in this direction at all. It only changes in this direction. So those are independent. Now, if I move this direction, it does change my position in this direction somewhat because going this direction is somewhat has a component, we say, in that direction. So when we talk about our directions, our dimensions, they need to be perpendicular. So I actually have a couple of clicker questions coming up on this, so make sure you're logged in. Um, but simple question, how many dimensions of space do we have? Do we live in? And please don't go all esoteric on me. <laughs> How many dimensions of space do we live in? Three. We live in three dimensions of space. Those dimensions can be defined in a lot of different ways. Very traditional ways would be up, down, north, south, east, west. So up and down is one dimension. North and south is one dimension. And east and west is one dimension. And those are all mutually perpendicular. Up and down is perpendicular to north and south. And up and down is perpendicular to east and west. And north and south is perpendicular to east and west. So that's one way of defining three independent directions. Another equivalent is forward, backward, left, right, and up, down. Right, it's equivalent to the other one. There are others, you know, like if you use spherical coordinates, you have in and out, the azimuth and the altitude, right? Um, it gets a little more confusing when you do those. So right now we have those for our dimensions. So we're going to talk today about how we deal with motion or with vectors when there's more than one direction available for us. So here's an example of two-dimensional motion. 
if you are confined to the streets of a flat city, like pick a city in Nebraska, um, that's two dimensional motion. You don't have any up and down. When, before I came here, ask somebody who had lived out here in Lincoln, what's it like in Lincoln? He said, it's hilly. I come out of here and I'm like, where are the hills? Well, we're on top of the tallest hill in the entire city right here. Did you know that? Tallest hill in the city. This is not hilly. This is pretty flat. Um, that makes the Dick Building like the tallest, the top of Dick Building is the tallest place in the city, just in case you're curious. <laughs> um, so it's two-dimensional motion if you're walk, going around the city streets because you're not going up and down. You're just going forward, back, left, and right. Now, of course, if you live in an actual hilly city, like let's say San Francisco, there's a lot of up and down there as well. So we're going to ask a few questions and then do some work. So how many, and I put confirmed to avoid, oh wait, I need three people, four people have answered now. I forgot to do one thing. I just stopped it. It's um, channel 33 is the channel, but I had forgotten to tell it that it's this class. So I'm actually resetting the session. So everyone's going to have to start over when I tell you. Maybe for some reason. Okay, now you can start over for, sorry about that. So yes, it's channel 33 or web fizz if you're using your smartphone. So at this point, we have Rebecca, Peter, Leslie, and Cole, who I don't have an answer from. So it's still Rebecca, Peter, and Leslie. It says I answered the right. Okay, yeah, yeah. And now Leslie has, it's just Rebecca. Okay, well, I'll, I'll move on. Talk to me afterward just so we can get in cahoots or whatever. So we had 27 people that said three and one person that said four. <laughs> now, four is not a stupid answer. I don't want people to laugh at this person because I said there, confirm spatial, put spatial in red. Because if you're a physicist, a normal physicist, you say that we live in four dimensions, but that's space-time. You guys have heard of the space-time continuum, right? Second semester, I, will, I like to say that, you know, warp to the space-time continuum. That's an actual physics thing, okay? And so I like to say things like that because they sound nerdy and make me grin. Um, we consider time, or more specifically, time multiplied by the speed of light a fourth dimension. I assume Alex just said something disparaging about me. Is that correct, Alex? No, I answered a question. Oh, uh, okay. One word answer. <laughs> Is he a nerd? Yes. Um, <laughs> so in, in physics, for normal physicists, we do say that we live in a four-dimensional world, but one of them is a time dimension. The other three are spatial. If you want to get really out there on us, if you believe in string theory, which is – a theory that looks promising but has no conclusive experimental um, confirmation, then we have, I think it's an additional seven spatial dimensions. And the idea is those spatial dimensions are so itty bitty that we don't interact with them, but that they exist. So that's not part of this class, just throwing it out there just so you can understand the curiosity of some of these higher level physics things. So spatial dimensions that are confirmed, that's how I ruled out the, you know, adding the additional ones, is three. And then our next question, which is like unto this one, what are the traditional definitions for these three spatial dimensions?
Okay, so everyone, but <laughs> Rebecca, whom I pressed the button like seven times for, <laughs> has an answer in. So the answers we got were seven, six, 15, and zero. Okay, I forgot to ask anyone last time. My bad. This time, Corso will tell us about his answer. Give us some reasoning behind that. Okay, he said C. Why did you say C? Because it just said five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> north and south, east and west. All of them are perpendicular to each other. And B is the same thing as A. So that's why I chose C. Okay, you cannot argue with his reasoning because you just said it five minutes ago. That's absolutely right. So this is legit. This is legit. Hence, both are traditional just you know that's just making sure we understand what's the reason why this is important in physics well a big part of the reason is what we call independence of motion we have an acceleration of gravity when something is in free fall now free fall means that it's flying with nothing affecting it except for gravity i said in lab yesterday i think it was that we consider everything in free fall unless told to consider something, well, if it's not touching anything, unless told to consider things like air resistance. So if I, I could have sworn that I told it to not say anything was correct, but I see from Gila's that it did tell you C was correct. I must have missed that. If I take Gila's phone and I drop it, <laughs> no, I won't do that. If I drop her phone while it's falling, we know the air is affecting it, but we consider it to be free fall for this level of class. So we pretend that there's no air. And so if there's no air, then as it falls, it only has acceleration vertical direction. How much is an acceleration vertical direction going to change its horizontal speed? It doesn't. That's what we mean by independence of motion. And so when we talk about trajectories, when we talk about throwing things, it flies through the air and it's only accelerating downward. And so we will, the reason we use vertical as one of our traditional directions is because the acceleration of gravity is vertical. Hence, as long as something is flying through the air, the only acceleration is in the vertical direction. The horizontal motion will stay constant. Now, this relates to one of our problems. We have a problem of a ball that you drop from a height, and everybody's height is different. But it falls, and it hits the ground, and it bounces back up. And just like this really bad ball, it starts up here, bounces up to a much lower height. It lost energy. Didn't have a very good coefficient of restitution, as we would say, in the nerd world. This had, for the time from when it left my hands, remember, we don't count while it's in my hands, but the instant it leaves my hands until the instant it touches the table, it's in free fall, so what's the acceleration? Okay, I heard negative 9.8 meters per second squared. The negative means down, so it has a constant acceleration until it hits the ground. When it hits the ground, it's no longer in free fall. The table's touching it and pushing on it. And so it won't have an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared down while it's touching the table. But when it bounces back off, the instant it leaves the table, what's the acceleration gonna be? 9.8 meters per second squared down. And when it gets up and it reaches its highest point, what's the acceleration? Still 9.8 meters per second squared down. Right? It's not zero up there. It's always just a, you know, it's speed. The vertical speed is zero up there, but not the acceleration. Okay, so independence of motion is a huge reason why we talk about this in physics class because we're going to work problems and we're going to say, okay, I'm going to work the problem in this direction. I have zero acceleration in this direction. I have 9.8 meters per second squared down is the acceleration. 
and then you just work the two directions separately. This picture, by the way, has arrows indicating the components, that is the speeds in specific directions. So the black is the horizontal speed, and you see the black arrows are all the same length, staying at constant speed. The green is the vertical speed, and you see the green is speeding up as it drops. And of course, the red ball just has the vertical speed changing. It didn't have a horizontal speed, so it stays zero for horizontal throughout. That's, you might have heard the age old question. If I take a bullet and hold it here, and I take a gun, hold the same height and I fire the gun at the same moment, drop the bullet from my other hand, which hits the ground first. Assuming general physics that there is no air and that the earth is perfectly flat, which I, I have seen there's lots of people it's making researches. There are more and more people who believe that. So Corso is correct. It's the same because the vertical acceleration is the same. They started with a vertical velocity of zero in both cases if I shot it horizontally. Okay, so that's a question you see a lot. So how does this come out in physics? Now, this here is a really simple problem because, you know, we want to start you easy. So this is going on a shopping trip, and you start from home, and you travel east nine blocks. Got to have units for distance. Um, I think I just used units for the name of the units, on, or I did, booked it on the next slide. And then you make a 90 degree turn and you walk five blocks north. We oftentimes will use X and Y to indicate the two dimensions. And so we have X positive to the right, Y positive up. That's our convention for an XY coordinate system. When you're using a coordinate system, you need to have it specified. So over here we have the compass that specifies north, south, east, west, if you're going to use that for your coordinate system. Or here, it has X going like this and Y going like this. How do I know they're going the directions the arrows show? <laughs> because the numbers were getting bigger there. So I usually would, in making my picture, and this will be part of the diagram for those five questions where you have to show your work, I'll put on there something that shows my coordinate system. That way I can talk about my X value, and I know if it's a bigger number, it's farther to the right. For x if it's a bigger number for y it's farther up because i have that to indicate the directions of increasing values now the question is well multiple questions here what's the distance traveled he said 13 Nine plus five. <laughs> yeah, 14. Okay, because distance is just how much was under your feet. So nine blocks plus five blocks. And I'm just using BL as an abbreviation for blocks. So the distance traveled was 14 blocks. What's the displacement? Okay, of course, I was quickly doing the math. A lot of people have some facility with this. Because our components, components are the pieces of a vector that are in the perpendicular coordinate direction. Because they're perpendicular, I have a right triangle. And you should have learned somewhere along the way that if you have a right triangle, you have a very simple mathematical relationship between the lengths of each leg. We call this the Pythagorean theorem. So for the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where a and b are the two short sides of the triangle, and c is the long side. The long side of the right triangle is always called the hypotenuse. So c is the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is the side that is opposite to the right angle. Opposite means it's not either of the two sides that are contributing to the angle. So the right angle is made by A and B. And so I'm just going to call this one A and this one B. And then the hypotenuse is going to be 
the vector that connects, oh, let's see if I can draw an arrow correctly today. <laughs> Somehow I went to the top of the screen instead of choosing the arrow tool. Do I dare try again? Oh, look, it is on the arrow too. What are the odds that worked? About zero? Okay, so forget the tools. That's what we call the resultant. The resultant is what you get when you add two vectors. It's also the hypotenuse C. So just doing my math here, nine blocks squared plus five blocks squared. Nine times nine, 81. Five times five, 25. 81, 25, 106. What are my units? I had blocks here, but it's squared. So my units are blocks squared. Notice I had parentheses on the left-hand side because I was squaring five blocks. On the right-hand side, I don't have the parentheses because it's only the blocks that are squared, the 106. I'm not going to square again. And so C equals the resultant is equal to the square root of 106 blocks squared. And even though it's on the next slide, I could just slide up to see it. Some of the calculator verify. We all know it's going to 10 squared is 100, so it's a little bit above 10. 11 squared is 121, so it's well below 11. 10.3, right? So that's the displacement. That's the difference between the starting and ending points. It's not the distance the person traveled. It's the difference between their starting and ending positions. So there we have, see, it says units here instead of blocks. We also might want to get the angle. Now, we did this using what we call the analytical method. If you look in Chapter 3, the analytical method is, is the end part, I think, of, well, it's Chapter, chapter 3.3. 3. The last section we'll cover today is the analytical part. I'm doing the analytical part first because it turns out most students are actually more comfortable with the analytical part, more comfortable with using things like the Pythagorean theorem. But if we were going to draw them, and yes, on the first exam, you're going to have to show adding vectors using a ruler and <laughs> what is that? Okay. Protractor. Yes, it says there. In my brain, protractors and compasses just get merged. I say it wrong half the time. So it's better for me to ask you what it's called than to declare that that's the wrong thing. Okay, so you'd measure angle with that and measure the length with a ruler. So you will have to actually draw the vectors carefully. And I'll get to that later in the lecture. This angle is, of course, this is supposed to say you measure the angle using your protractor. When you use the protractor, here's some things that people can screw up. Um, protractor, I, of course, don't have it here. Well, there, there should be one on the doors here. So here's a protractor. I know I don't have a pretty picture that you can see up there. I can zoom this one, but it's not going to be all that beautiful. The protractors have a baseline that's usually not the bottom, right? The baseline here is like three millimeters above the bottom, and it has a hole in the center. That hole is where you want to put the angle that you're measuring. So if I'm measuring this angle right here, I want the whole of my protractor to line up there where the angle begins. And then I want my baseline to be lined up going along the baseline here. And then I measure the angle going out here. And of course, make sure you pay attention to where you're measuring from. Most people know this, but sometimes, and I have, you know, when I was in college, I never paid attention. To and so I have done silly things like put it like this. Well, if I put it like that, I'm going to get the wrong angle. 
right? You have to have the angle on that center hole. So just be aware of how those things work. How can we get this angle? So I'm going to go back to the previous slide. How can we get that angle using trigonometry? Okay. Yes, we're going to use our trigonometric functions. We tend to call unknown angles the Greek letter theta, TH in Greek. And we use the trigonometric functions, and I heard people say sokatoa. Um, that's, well, it, it just cracks me up. I was looking online and somebody asked a question, how do you remember the order of the planets? What's your memory tool? Somebody responded, well, I always remember them like this. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. See, easy. Um, but we have mnemonics, things to help us remember. And Sokatoa is one of the very common ones. Now, do you have to have this memorized? The answer is no. You will have the definitions of sine, cosine, and tangent on the test. But let's just, actually, I'm going to go up and set it to the right. Draw a triangle here and choose an angle. So this one here is theta. If that's my angle, I can immediately identify the names of the three sides of the triangle. So the names are going to be, let's start with the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is the longest side of a right triangle. If it's not a right triangle, you got to do things a little differently. So the hypotenuse is opposite to that right triangle. That line labeled height does not contribute to my right angle. The opposite side is the side that does not contribute to the angle I'm interested in. So if this theta is the angle I'm interested in, then this one here is opposite to it and doesn't contribute to the angle. And of course that leaves the last one. The adjacent side is the side that with the hypotenuse contributes to your angle. With those then we have our definitions Sine, the so, is sine theta is opposite of hypotenuse. The ka, hypotenuse, is cosine theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. And toa is tangent of theta is equal to opposite over adjacent, which is exactly the same as sine of theta over cosine theta. I like to put parentheses around my angles. You don't have to, but sometimes it can be confusing if you don't. So that's why I like to put the parentheses around them. So those are definitions for sine, cosine, and tangent. So if I look at my triangle here, we know the hypotenuse is 10.3 blocks. The adjacent is nine blocks and the opposite is five blocks. We know those because we, we were given nine blocks and five blocks, and then we calculate the 10.3. So given those definitions, how can I find the angle? Okay. Now, the simple answer you could have given would be sine theta, cosine theta, or tangent theta because I have all three sides. What's the best way? The best way is to use the two sides that aren't calculated, the ones that were given, because then there's no round off error to be involved. So I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do the best way, I'm gonna take the two sides that are not calculated. So that's opposite and adjacent. Which of my three simple trigonometric functions relates opposite and adjacent? Tangent. And so I say tangent, of theta is equal to opposite over adjacent, which is going to be five blocks over nine blocks. What's in terms of units, what is five blocks over nine blocks? It's unitless. 
that's what you have to have for the result of a trigonometric function, the result of sine, cosine, or tangent. It has to give you a unit list value. Um, for people who haven't learned any fun little math tricks, if you have any integer less than 9 divided by 9, the answer is just the integer you know, point and that integer infinite times. So this is 0.555 repeating. If you hadn't learned, that's just a simple, you know, get the fraction straight in your head. So I have tangent theta is 5 ninths, or 0.555 repeating forever. I need to find theta. To find theta, we need to use what is defined as the inverse function of theta. The inverse function means if I take a function, I do the inverse function of it, it gives me the argument. So the inverse tangent of tangent theta, by definition of what an inverse function means, has to give me theta. So I have to do inverse tangent, and your calculator could have different symbols for inverse tangent. It could be a tan. Or it could be arctan because that A stood for arc. Or in some rare cases, it could say inverse tan. Or a much more common case, it could say tan raised to the minus 1. Normally, raised to the minus means 1 over. Raised to the minus 1 means 1 over. But in this case, that does not mean 1 over tangent. It means the inverse of the tangent function. So notice I put R tan or inverse tangent of the answer here, and that's equal to theta. If you want to see that in long form, A tan of tangent theta equals A tan of 5 ninths. But A tan of tangent theta by definition of an inverse function is theta. So, somebody with the calculator, what is the arc tangent of 5 ninths? It's what? Yeah, that's, that's fine. In fact, I wanted to have that brought out. So, 0 0.5? Yeah, 0 0.507. Okay, 0 0.507. Is that what most of you got? Okay, a few of you did. That would be, I assume she did it correctly, in radians. Radians are actually the natural unit of angle. What do you usually measure angles in? Degrees. degrees. Why degrees? Because what? Because they're easier. Okay, because they're easier. <laughs> they are easier. That's why we have them, because they're easier. As I understand things, ancient um, astronomers noted that there were nearly 365 days, or near, nearly 360 days in a year. Most people don't even know how many days are in a year. But let's see, does anyone know actually to the decimal how many days are in a year? All right. If it was 365.25, we would still use the Julian calendar. The Julian calendar had leap days every four years so that you have 365 days plus one quarter day. And so it's 365 and a quarter days in a year. But even back, you guys may have seen the ancient Babylonian thing that's, what, 3,700 years old that works out these trigonometric problems. Do you guys see that in the news this week? Yeah, it's got mathematicians all excited because they thought that this was figured out by the Greeks much later. They knew that 365.25 wasn't correct, but they figured it was close enough. But over time, the seasons drifted. So you might know, we have the winter solstice, when the sun is at its lowest point on the horizon and starts rising again. That's in the Northern Hemisphere. We have Christmas Day, and we have New Year's Day. Those are all supposed to be the same thing. But they're not because they kind of got cast in stone at different times. 
And so the Gregorian calendar was a reworking to get the right number of days in a year. And so the correct number of days in a year, and I had gone way off topic, I know. There are 365.2422 days in a year. Okay. And so we have our system that has a leap year every four years or a leap day every four years, except every 100 years we skip leap day. Did you know that? So years that end in 100 skip leap day. How many people were alive in 2000? All right, most of you. How many people remember if there was a leap day in 2000? There was a leap day. They didn't skip it because if you skipped it every 100 years, you would drop it from 365.25 to 365.24 days a year. And so they add back in the leap day every year that's divisible by 400, and 2000 is divisible by 400, so they didn't skip, skip the leap day. So that makes the Gregorian calendar have 365.2425 days in a year. That's the calendar that we're on now, and it will take – thousands of years before you have one day drift. So it's good enough for us. Okay, so back to why we have 360 degrees in a circle. So they said, wow, that's pretty, 365 days. It's pretty close to 360. And so they said 360 is just a magical number because 360 is evenly divisible by, well, everything's evenly divisible by one, but it's also evenly divisible by two and by three and by four and by five and by six, not by seven, and by eight, by nine, and by 10, not by 11, and by 12. So it's evenly divisible by all but two numbers from one through 12. And they said, there's gotta be some magical property to a number that has that much evenly divisible things. And as Cole said, that makes it easier for us to do our math with. And so that's why they chose 360 degrees for a circle. One degree is supposed to be the distance the sun moves against the stars each day. So if you look at where the sun is with respect to the stars, it's one degree different each day, roughly, because there's, you know, if a degree was, if there are 365.2422 degrees in a circle, then it would be exactly one degree per day. So that's where it comes from. It's not the natural unit for angles. Angles should be unitless. A basic equation is an arc length is equal to the radius multiplied by the angle. But arc length has units of length and radius has units of length. And so the angle has to have no units and radians are the unitless units. And so pi is a natural number that occurs so that you have a relationship between the radius and the um, the arc length. So radians are actually the natural unit for angle. We will use them occasionally. Later on, we'll use them more when we move away from doing this stuff. So you have to be comfortable going with radians or degrees. We write RAD there for the angle to indicate that this is the unitless angle. Radians are a unit that means no units. Nice to know, huh? So it can appear and disappear at will because it's really no unit. If you put degrees, what was it, 29.03? Okay, so I'm just going to put 29.0 degrees. That degree sign says you're going to have to use a conversion factor to get it into the natural no unit units. So we used inverse tangent to find that angle. The whole point of all of this going into the number of degrees in a circle was, yes, <laughs> that. Uh, it said 29.1, so it must have been not 0.03. Either that or they did their math wrong. <sighs> adding vectors. I talked about adding vectors previously, and I showed a number line, adding them. Tip to tail is the way my teacher in high school taught me. And so tip to tail is always what I say. Our textbook says head to tail. Some people say tail to head. Okay, I don't care what you call it. But what is important is when you add vectors, you draw one vector starting at your origin, 
And at the end of the first vector, you draw the second vector. At the end of the second vector, you draw the third vector and so on. And then the resultant, the sum of all those vectors starts where you started and ends where you ended. Now I will show you an exam question that good old Dr. Walker gave in general physics when I was in grad school and I was the, the lecture TA. I had to be in charge of grading exams. I didn't have to grade them, thank God. I had like four student workers and I said, okay, you're gonna grade these three, you're gonna grade these three and so on. And then I had to supervise and make sure they were doing a good job. So he gave them a nice coordinate system And then he put his vectors on there. And so he had vector one, vector two, vector three, vector four, vector five, vector six, vector seven, vector eight, vector nine, vector 10. Well, actually he had A, B, C, D on them, but you know what I mean? That's supposed to be straight line. So he had it like that. So each one's A, B, C, D, E, F. And he asked the question was, what is A, plus, a vector plus B, B vector plus C vector? going through all of them. Was he evil? Two students in the class of about 100 would say he was evil. Because they spent, it was the first question on the test, and they spent the entire test period working on that problem. And they didn't answer any of the rest. Pretty much you have to drop physics after that test. So those students would say he was evil. What did the rest of the students do? <laughs> They looked at it and they said, the starting and ending points are the same location. And he showed them added tip to tail. And so since the, the resultant is just the difference between the starting and ending points and they start and end at the same points, the answer is zero. So the students who understood vectors just put zero and went on. It took no time at all. Those who didn't or those who understood the mechanics but didn't understand the idea Spent the entire class period working out what you know turns out to be a ridiculously annoying problem. And I did feel bad for those students because yeah, you pretty much, I mean, if you get zero on your first test, what are you gonna do in the class, right? And it makes a good point, but if it makes people drop the class because they just missed this little idea, it's probably not fair. Anyway, it, it does illustrate the idea of. You've got to understand the concepts behind it and not just say, I'm going to work this out and grind through it. It just takes too long. On that point with homework, if you have a homework problem, and honest to goodness, if, if, if you spend a half hour on a problem and you're not making headway, don't keep going. Write me an email, you know, talk to a friend, get some help. Because you, nobody's got that kind of time to sit there and spend two hours on one problem. And all of these problems aren't going to take that long when you understand it. And there's some work involved to understand it, but you don't have enough time to sit there and spend two hours on one problem. Can you get a witness? <laughs> you guys don't agree with me? You got that kind of time? I mean, football season is coming up in another two weeks. So yeah. So adding these vectors on the test, you're going to be given two vectors. You'll either have to add them or subtract them. I'll have subtraction just coming up. So you will need to, I'll give you a piece of graph paper. That graph paper is going to be, yeah. You'll need to put your coordinate system on there and then start at your origin, draw the first vector, use a ruler to make sure it's the right length. Use your protractor to make sure it's at the right angle. At the end of the first one, then you put your second vector. Once again, use the protractor to make sure it's the right angle and using your ruler to make sure it's the right length. Then you draw the line from beginning to ending point. You measure its length and you use your protractor to measure its angle as well. Now measuring the angles, I talked about using the protractor. I didn't talk about the convention for angle. I just put in my picture here. There it is. 0.507 radians. The convention for angle is, well, as a standard, because angle is giving you the direction, 
you have to have it's the angle from some reference point in what direction. So by convention, we measure positive angles for counterclockwise rotation. That's the convention. And by convention, we usually measure angles from the horizontal going to the right. But that doesn't mean you need to follow it or that if you just put 29 degrees, that you'll get the right answer because you need to specify 29 degrees from where in one dire what direction. And so for this here, if I was doing an actual physics problem, I would have had something like, well, the angle is 29 degrees Y going in the Y direction from the X axis. So if I put 29 degrees y of x, then that tells me, ah, go from the x-axis, go up 29 degrees, there's the direction it's pointing. All right, back to, oh my goodness, I have two minutes left? Really? Maybe I shouldn't have talked about the uh, ancient things. <laughs> That's great, we didn't have to do anything that, okay. One last clicker question before we head out, and I guess I will do some more vector stuff next class period. How do you add two vectors graphically? It is a really important thing. And no, the answer is not magic. Just for the record, one of my sister's high school classmates was one of the inventors of Magic Gathering. Made a lot of money when they sold it to, um, what was they sold to Nintendo? I don't remember. Now he's dead. Okay, everybody's answered. Who's going to answer? We had 0, 25, 1, 0, 2. <laughs> okay, I appreciate the honesty there of two people saying, I don't, but you do. Um, Lauren, what did you answer? Give us an explanation. Okay, head to tail. Head to head is absolutely wrong. You do not add vectors like this. That is one way to write it if you're subtracting. I try to avoid that as I'll talk about next class period. So head to head is definitely incorrect. I don't know. Well, that's an honest answer. All right, have a great day. I'll see you on Friday. Remember the labs are due tomorrow night, Thursday night. There are the little copy cards next to the copy machines, both down this floor and the second floor.